we bring back all glory, honor, and praise to your name. For you are so good to us. Because of your love, you have established schools where we can access Christian education. And through it, we can learn about your wonderful love. Bless our schools, our educators, and all who are responsible for the operation of these schools, Lord. Be with us all as we celebrate the Education Sabbath today. May your blessings be upon us. Amen.
Our celebration of Education Day here in Conception Adventist Academy. This virtual program is actually part two of the celebration because yesterday, as a scheduled Education Day, August 20, 2022, was celebrated through a simultaneous church visitation promoting Adventist education, its aim, philosophy, and reasons why. Adventist education. Tonight is a continuation of Education Day celebration, which we involve parents, students, alumni, and teachers. Also, a borrowed message from the North Philippine Union Conference Hope Channel, message delivered by Dr. Bienvenido Mergal, our Education Director of the Southern Asia Pacific Division. I was so blessed listening yesterday and I would like you also to experience the same blessing. Again, I would like to welcome you in our virtual celebration of Education Day. Conception Adventist Academy, the school that prepares for life, CAE, Christ above all. A school where love is shared, lives are transformed, and God is present.
Let us praise God for this opportunity of celebrating God's greatness through the education ministry of the church. Today, we are celebrating the World Education Day, educating for eternity as our theme. I would like to express my appreciation to the NPUC education leaders, our teachers, our mission superintendents, our students, our church members, in always raising the banner of Adventist education, making it distinct and quality. The theme of our celebration this week, which is also the center of our study this morning is teach like Jesus think through his mind. Let me share some passages that will serve as anchor of our study. The first one is in Philippians 2.5. It says, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Another important passage is in John 13 5. It says, I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Another important passage is in Romans 12 1 2. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be it transformed by the renewing of your mind then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Before we go into the study of these passages and try to glean some important insights from these passages, let us bow our heads for the Holy Spirit to guide us. Loving Heavenly Father, we humbly come before thy throne of grace. Loving Father, as we study your words this morning, may your Holy Spirit controls our mind, our thoughts, and even our behavior. Thank you for the assurance that you will guide us. We pray in the loving name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. First, we have to consider about the three points that we are going to study in these passages. I would like to talk about attitude or mind of the teachers, and then number two, the methods, strategies of the teachers with the mind of Jesus. And then towards the end, I will be sharing the end goal of teaching, learning with the mind of Jesus. But before going into this, I would like to ask ourselves, what is an Adventist teacher? There are three important things that we have to consider based on 2 Corinthians 5.18. Apostle Paul was saying, by the time we are saved by Jesus Christ, then we enjoy peace in Him. And once we have that peace, we experience reconciliation because He entrusted us the ministry. And that ministry is no other than 
the ministry of reconciliation. Not only that, but Apostle Paul continues by saying, you also are given the message of reconciliation. And then towards the end of verse 20, it says, we are the instrument of reconciliation. In other words, we are the messengers of reconciliation. This is what a teacher has. The teacher is God's vehicle of transforming lives. Considering the ministry that is given to the teacher, we consider the teacher having a very sacred work. Why? Because his influence affects eternity. His work is delicate, for it can be a means of grace or a means of curse. So let us remind ourselves when we look at the role and responsibility of the teacher that the teacher cannot be substituted or replaced with media, workbooks, or other church programs because he has a very important role in educating our children. Because of this role, it is very important that the teacher should follow the model. He cannot be at his own as far as teaching is concerned. He should always follow the model to make sure his solemn and divine task is shielded and guided by the principles and models of Jesus, who is, by the way, the truth and the life. This is what Ellen G. White said. Education, page 282. As the highest preparation for your work, I point you to the words, the life, the methods of the prince of teachers. I bid you consider him. Here is your true ideal. Behold it, dwell upon it, until the spirit of the divine teacher shall take possession of your heart and life. This is the encouragement coming from the spirit of prophecy that our model as teachers, model as educators, is no other than our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So let us now come to the mind of Jesus as Paul counseled us to have in Philippians 2.5. This is considered as a very significant admonition as far as teaching ministry is concerned. So number one, what is the mind of Jesus? Well, in some translations, mind is translated as attitude. But I would like to point out significant principles that we can find in Philippians 2.5. We should understand that when Paul says, let this mind be new, which is also in Christ Jesus, he was pointing out that there is that existence of the Christian mind. Christian mind exists. Number two, that we have to receive the mind of Christ. And number three, as Christians, we must think Christianly. And number four, the object reference of our thinking should be that of Christ. So the question is, what is the attitude of Jesus? Let us intently study Philippians 5, 7 to 12. Because we will be able to understand what is Christ's mind in Philippians 2, 5 to 11. Philippians 2, 6 will tell us that he comes in the likeness of men 
And then if we are going to connect that to Luke 19 verse 10, the very purpose of Jesus is to seek and to save. And then in Philippians 2, 8, he humbled himself. It means that Jesus had a humble mind. In Philippians 2, 7, it says he served. It means, it means that the mind of Jesus is a serving mind. And then in Philippians 2, 8, it says he obeyed. It means that his mind was submissive and obedient to the Father. And verses 9 to 11, it says, He exalted and glorified God. It means that his mind is exalting and glorifying to the Father. So there are five kinds of mind or attitude that Christian teachers or educators should possess and demonstrate in their teaching ministry. And I would like to study uh, each of them. The first one, the teacher's mind and attitude in teaching or in educating for eternity, first, he or she must have the seeming mind. The seeming mind has the idea of restoring and transforming the lives of the students. So teachers who have the mind like Christ would always have the thought and the feeling to assist the students in their struggles. Their passion is to implant in the students' lives the hope for eternal life. And this is what the spirit of prophecy says. Fundamentals of Christian Education, page 436. Eternal interest should be the great theme of teachers and students. The teachers need to be sanctified through the truth. And all important thing should be the conversion of their students that they may have a new heart and life. So in other words, we as educators, we need to have a saving or redeeming mind. So in order to possess this kind of mind, the teacher should be infused with God's truth. And I would like to go into the second aspect of these very foundational principles. The first one is, like Jesus, we need to have a humble mind. You know, humility is a position of soul and body and life that acknowledges and embraces the goodness of God and the humanis, human, humanness of self. So there is what we call authenticity and willingness to accept our limitation to learn and serve our students or serve people. Here is what the inspiration of the Lord says. A Christian teacher reveals true humility by showing the gentleness of Christ, by being always ready to help others, by speaking kind words and performing unselfish acts which elevate and ennoble the most sacred message that has, co uh, has come to our world. This is what it means to have a humble mind. So an educator, a teacher, should possess a humble mind. The third, an educator based on the mind of Jesus must be submissive. Submission, sub, submissive in the sense that he is willing and sincere to submit the leadings of the Holy Spirit and follow the truth. The teachers who think like Christ is not dependent of himself but follows the instruction from the Lord. Daily, he is willing to receive the endowment of God's wisdom and knowledge. And the last kind of attitude of, ma of mind is exalting and glorifying mind. So it is the role of the teachers. It is his work to exalt and glorify God. Exalting the cross. The spirit of prophecy says, the cross in our teaching 
must be the epicenter of all true education. Ministry of Healing, page 461. It says, Let the cross of Christ be made science of all education, the center of all teaching, and all study. That's the responsibility of the teacher. That's the responsibility of the educator to raise the cross, to let everyone know about the message of salvation. In fact, Ellen G. White is saying that the most important role of the teacher is to proclaim the science of salvation. Gospel Workers, page 159, it says, Christ crucified, Christ risen, Christ ascended into the heavens, Christ coming again, should be the message of all educators having the mind of Jesus. So we would say, when we teach, when we educate our children, our mind must be a saving redeeming mind it must be a humble mind it must be a serving mind it must be a submissive mind and if we have all these kinds of mind then we will be able to have the glorifying mind the exalting mind glorifying our lord and savior jesus christ so that's the first principle that we have to consider a teacher must have the mind of Jesus Christ. He must think through the mind of Jesus Christ. I will go to the second point in my presentation, the methods and strategies of Jesus. What were the methods and strategies of Jesus? Ministry of Healing, page 143, it says, Christ's method alone will give true success in reaching the people. The Savior, the Savior mingled with men as one who desired their good. He showed his sympathy for them, ministered to their needs, and won their confidence. Then he bid them follow me. There are important principles that we can get from this uh, statement of Ellen G. White. The first one is he mingled with men. It means contact. He desired their good. It means concern. He showed his empathy. It means compassion. He ministered to their needs. It means Jesus was caring. He won their confidence. It means that establishes confidence to effect conviction in the life of the students. And he bid them follow me. It means that the focus of Jesus is for them to be committed to Jesus Christ. And that is in the area of conversion. So my friends, let us focus on each of this in order for us to better understand these principles of Jesus referring to his methods and strategies. So there are C's in the methods and strategies of Jesus. First, a teacher who thinks like Jesus teaches based on the context. Context is very important. You know, when Jesus Christ was teaching, he considered the he considered the peculiar needs of the students. You will notice the different backgrounds of the students of Jesus. First, you have here the impotent man of, Be of, the impotent man of Bethesda. We consider him as the insecure student. The rich young ruler, we consider him the eager student. Peter, he was considered as the experimenter. The two men of Emmaus, they were considered as the discouraged students. Mary Magdalene, the humiliated student. 
the woman at the well, the mass students, the leaper, the unpopular, unaccepted, Nicodemus, the gifted student, Zacchaeus, the early, the crafty student, and the woman bleeding, we consider him or her the shy student. So Jesus Christ was actually catering to the different needs of his students. So when we talk about context, we are talking about the teacher and the learners. That's why Apostle Paul said, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another in all wisdom. This means, my friends, that the content of our teaching should be infused with God's truth. Thus, the word of God is not only to be recited, but it has to dwell in the learners and the teachers. Another method of Jesus. Connection. The spirit of prophecy says he mingled with them to establish points of connection and relationship. Here is what the, the inspiration of the Lord says. The, educator, the, educate, the educated were charmed with Christ's teaching and the uneducated were always profited for he appealed to their understanding. So here is Jesus being adaptable to people in such a way that he would be able to make some connections. So Jesus has a way of connecting to the interests and needs of his students. He was adaptable. But how does he connect? That's the question. This is what the spirit of prophecy says. Continually, he was seeking to draw from things seen, illustrations by which to present the living oracles of God. Through the imagination, he reached the heart. His illustrations were taken from the things of daily life, and also they were simple. They had in them wonderful depth of meaning. The birds of the air, the lilies of the field, the seed, the shepherd and the sheep, with these objects, Christ illustrated immortal truth. So this is how Jesus Christ connected to his learners. Next method of Jesus, we can find it in Mark 1.41. It says, then Jesus moved with compassion, he stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I am willing to be cleansed. My friends, Jesus was compassionate in his teaching. He taught his students with love and compassion. He showed concern and sympathy to the students. Again, this is what the spirit of prophecy says. His sympathetic spirit that shone out in every look and word he would have attracted the large congregation that he did. Desire of Ages 254. Another statement from Ellen G. White. She says, In compassionate love and tenderness, he cheered and comforted and instructed all who heard him, for grace was poured upon his lips that he might convey to the men in the attractive way the treasure of truth. That's how Jesus Christ demonstrated his compassion to his learners. Another statement from the spirit of prophecy. It says, He passed by no man, being as worthless, but sought to apply the healing remedy to every soul in whatever company he found himself. He presented a lesson appropriate to the time and circumstance. Every neglect or insult 
shown by men to their fellow men only made him conscious of their need of his divine human sympathy. What a loving, compassionate teacher. Can we teach this kind of passion, my dear teachers? That's the question that we have to ask ourselves. The next, Christ taught with conviction. Jesus Christ impressed the truth to create awareness and direction in life of his students. Again, another message from the spirit of prophecy. Christ did not deal in abstract theories, but in that which is essential to the development of character, that which will enlarge man's capacity for knowing God and increase his efficiency, efficiency to do good. He spoke to men of those truths that relate to the conduct of life and that take hold upon eternity. So, very important concept, conviction. It is the responsibility of the teacher to really impress the truth from the scripture. When we share the message to the students, we have to consider the big idea, impress this to their hearts so that they will be aware. And when they have that awareness, then they will be convicted. And then when they will be convicted, then transformation begins. The last C that I would like to share is commitment. The work of Jesus was to help students make decisions and to commit to follow him. This is what the spirit of prophecy says. The method of Jesus. He spoke directly to every mind and appealed to every heart. So he doesn't leave a student without making an appeal and making a decision. He wants the faces of his hearers mark the lighting up of his countenance. So he was so observant of what is happening to the learner. The quick responsive glance which told the truth had reached the soul and there vibrated in his heart the answering chord of sympathetic joy. The same personal interest, the same attention to individual development are needed in the educational work today. So this is a very important uh, principle that we have to consider relating to the methods and strategies of Jesus Christ. I will go to the last point of my presentation, the goal of teaching and learning. According to Mrs. Ellen G. White, the highest goal of education, according to her, is higher than the highest human thought can reach, is God's ideal for his children. Godliness, Godlikeness is the goal to be reached. Before the student, there is open a path of continual progress. So the highest goal of education is for God's children, the learners, to attain to godliness and God-likeness. Again, another statement from Ellen G. White. The object of the great teacher is the restoration of the image of God in the soul, and every teacher in our school should work in harmony with this purpose. That's what fundamental of education says. So our role as teacher, as far as discipleship education, is to help the students grow and then help them to be committed to Jesus Christ, to save them so that they will be able to serve and then they become disciples of Jesus Christ. So 
the scope of education is from the seeker. Those who are not yet, or those who have not known yet Jesus Christ, making them believers in Jesus Christ, and then become disciple discipler of Jesus Christ. If the church will do this, then we will be able to comply the ministry of the church in perfecting the sense, working for the ministry of the church, and then we will be able to edify the body of Christ. So our goal in teaching, my friends, is transformation. In Christian education, learning is measured by a change in the life of the students. Christian teaching is not just the pouring of facts and information. Learning is vibrant process that involves change of mind, the intellect, the heart, the feelings, and even the behavior or action. So, the role of Adventist education is we have to seek the learners, help them to find Jesus Christ, to have faith in Jesus Christ. And then when they have that relationship with Jesus Christ, then they integrate that faith. They will have that commitment in Jesus Christ and through that commitment, then they will be able to develop their character. This is what it means by education for eternity. This is our goal, the redemption of our children. So we have these three important letters. S means that we have to seek and learn God's truth. And that is the role of scholarship. Then we have another S. We have to save them by faith so that they can have vibrant relationship with Jesus Christ. And this is what it means by spirituality. And letter D means we have to develop in students Christ's character so that they will be able to become mature and then be able to participate in God's work. And that is what it means by discipleship. So, my friends, this morning, again, I would like to bring you to the counsel of the spirit of prophecy, making Jesus Christ as our model. It is very important in Christian education, in educating for eternity, that there is no other model in our ministry, in our teaching ministry, our model should be Jesus and Jesus Christ. Why? Because as far as the principles, the foundation of the attitude of teaching, we can derive it from the ministry of Jesus Christ. So again, I would like to reiterate the counsel from the book education, it says, as the highest preparation for your work, I appoint you to the words, the life, the methods of the prince of teachers. And this is Jesus Christ. I bid you consider him. Here is your true ideal. Behold it. Dwell upon it until the spirit of the divine teacher shall take possession of your heart and life. And then she further, added, she further said, reflecting as a mirror of the glory of the Lord, you will be transformed into the same image. This is the secret power over your pupils. So this morning, my dear friends, we are very happy, we are very grateful because the Bible has given us important principles in relation to the attitude we should have in 
educating for eternity. We have mentioned a lot of these principles. And then we are also grateful and happy because the spirit of prophecy and the scripture has given us models on how we are going to educate our children and our students. The teaching strategies of Jesus, the methods of Jesus, is very much applicable to us. So what we need is to follow this model. To have the mind of Jesus Christ. And if we develop the mind of Jesus, then we will be able to be successful in our ministry in educating our children. My friends, our resolve must be, I am an Adventist educator. That should be our commitment. I am an Adventist educator. I think through Christ's mind. I will go educating for eternity. So it is my prayer that we teachers, we education leaders, we parents, church members, we would develop the mind of Jesus. That we will be involved in the great work of redemption, preparing our children, preparing our learners, not only in this world, but in the world to come. May the Lord bless us as we continue celebrating God's goodness through this education for eternity. God bless us. Ngayon ang araw ng kaligtasan mo, kaibigan ko. Baka ang bukas ay di na darating. Buhay mo'y madaling lilipas at magawa wakas. Kaligtasan ay nasa Diyos lamang. Saan ka na bubuhay, mahanag kaibigan? Sa Diyos ba o sa pansarili lamang? Saan ka patutungo, langit ba o ipyerno? Isipin mo ito, kaibigan ko. Ngayon ang araw ng kaligtasan mo, kaibigan ko. Baka ang bukas ay di na darating. Buhay mo'y madaling lilipas at magwawakas. Kaligtasan ay nasa Diyos lamang. Ika'y naging tao. Upang maglingkot sa Diyos lamang Tanggapin mo ang daan Tungo sa kaligtasan Ang makamta ng buhay na walang hanggan Ngayon ang araw ng kaligtasan mo Kaibigan ko Baka ang bukas ay di na Narating, buhay mo'y madaling lilipas at magwawakas, kaligtasan ay nasa Diyos lamang. Magpasya ka ngayon habang may panahon, alin lang ay pawin mo ngayon. Huwag kang magpaligaw, huwag nang magalinlangan, pinto ng iyong puso ay buksan.
kayo ng araw ng kaligtasan mo, kaibigan ko. Maka ang bukas ay di na darating. Buhay mo'y madaling lilipas at magwawakas. Kaligtasan ay nasa Diyos lamang. Ngayon ang araw ng kaligtasan mo, kaibigan ko. Baka ang bukas ay di na darating. Buhay mo'y madaling lilipas at magwawakas. Kaligtasan ay nasa Diyos lamang. Kaligtasan ay nasa Diyos lamang. Kaligtasan ay nasa Diyos lamang. that came into my mind when I heard about the name of the school, Conception Adventist Academy is a Christian school, which means owned and operated by the Adventist Church. Since it is a Christian school, naisip ko po na napapaktis at nagagawa po dito the way how a Christian walk to God. So it means they are learning the words of God aside from the academics academic subjects, I mean, kaya po hindi ako nagdala ang isip na dito po po i-enroll ang aking anak. Isa po ito na pinaka-important ang tungkulin as a parent na mailapit po natin ang, ang ating mga anak sa Panginoon dahil dito hindi po sila mapariwara at maisa puso po nila ang mga salita ng Diyos as their guide on their journey of life. Secondly, I just Adventist education for my daughter because it is a higher education. It is higher in standard. I mean, unlike in the public school, the emphasis on discipline, especially on discipline, disciplining the the students and having academic excellence. Thank you again, Mom Leslie, for choosing me to share my idea regarding your question. Why do you send your children in CAA? First and foremost, I choose CAA for my children to continue their secondary education simply because I and my husband graduated here. So in short, this is our alma mater. But the very reason is, this is a Christian school and I do believe that this institution will help us or will help our children to become more responsible, disciplined, respectful students. Since this school develop or total or develop the for the aspects or different aspects of life, it's are the physical, the mental, emotional, social and spiritual aspects. Thank you very much. Good evening po sa ating lahat. Ako po ay isang nanay na may pinakaaral na tatlong anak. Yung panganay ko pong anak, ang pinilit po niyang pag-aralan mula grade 7 hang up to now po ay sa Adventist Institution. Ngayon po, uh, Pati po yung dalawa, yung kap, dalawa niya pong kapatid ay doon din po nag-aral sa institution po ng Adventist. At wala po kaming pinagsisihan na mag-asawa na doon sila pinag-aral dahil nakita po namin sa kanilang tatlong magkakapatid ang pagtubog ng kanilang spiritual. Kasi lagi po silang kasali sa mga iba't ibang aktivit activities sa school, sa church, at saka sa mga youth. Kaya mga magulang, uh, kailangan nating i-push ang ating mga anak na sana sa Adventist school natin sila papasukin para 
lalo pang lalawig ang kanilang malalaman tungkol sa ating Panginoon, bukod sa kanilang academics. At, at sa institution po ng Adventist School, nakita po namin at naramdaman po namin na lalo po kami pinaghubog na family as a family. Kasi dito namin natutunan at lalo po kami naging close na isang family to worship in the morning in in the evening as well po pag pumupunta po kami sa church isang buong pamilya po kami kaya their parents adventist education is the best kaya hikayatin po natin ang ating mga anak na doon sila mag-aral para sa ganun ay mas lalong at mas marami pa po silang matututunan tungkol sa Panginoon I preferred Adventist school because I believe that the discipline inside the school will help me focus with my studies. Aside from the distance from my home, I am also interested in music, wherein your school specializes. Adventist education is knowing more about God, our Creator, and our Redeemer. I love to study in our Adventist school because know this would help my young mind mold with good traits and good character to become a better person someday for the Lord. I believe Adventist education would train me to develop and obtain equal interest in the physical, mental, moral, and spiritual aspects of life at my young age through God's help. This education has to shape my character. The impact of Adventist education to me was a transformation of my life. I was a Catholic before, but because of Adventist education, I have given an opportunity to know Jesus more. I decided to be baptized because of the enlightenment activity of Adventist education, like week of prayer, and other religious activities. They also started reaching my family, and because of that, my family was also baptized. I believe that Adventist education was not all about marriage. It fostered a balanced development of a whole person spiritually, intellectually, physically, and socially. A choice to be here at Conception Adventist Academy as a missionary teacher is also an impact of a Seventh-day Adventist education. My parents were not yet SDA when they enrolled me to an Adventist school, Conception Adventist Academy. I have seen the benefit of studying in this school because I was not only taught academically but more on the wholesome development of the four aspects of life. Because of this, I decided to continue my college to NLAC Northern Luzon Adventist College and my parents supported me too. In there, I accepted Jesus through baptism. My lifestyle changed and my parents have seen the difference in me. They also enrolled my other siblings to CAA for they believed that we, their children, are not only being prepared for the future but also being prepared for eternity. Being the only Adventist in the family, I stood to be an example. I did not give them Bible studies. I only asked the district pastor to visit them, but because they have seen the impact of Adventist education in my life, they also have accepted the faith that I have, and now we are already one in faith. Adventist education prepared me for life, and it trained and developed my character. It is an opportunity for me for the growth of my mental, emotional, intellectual, and most especially, spiritual aspect of my life. My love and faith in God grew bigger. Uh, also, my talent in singing was improved. I learned basic concepts of some of the musical instruments. At least, even with the least I know, I have something to share in our church and I have something also to teach to my students and to my uh, sons, of course. 
you know, life is hard. Life is never an easy road. But what with love and faith that being nurtured in Adventist education, I was able to surpass every challenge that come along my way. That's why I, I will never forget the em impact of Adventist education in my life. It changed me so much.
everybody is nice here. It's a great school. I have great friends here. The teachers are really nice. They teach us a lot about God. Our objective is to reach every child and point them to the Savior. We're educating for eternity. The responsibility is awesome. The rewards are eternal. journey to excellence began in Frontier America more than a century ago. Seventh-day Adventist church founders envisioned a revolutionary system of church-sponsored schools that offer every child high-quality, balanced Christian training. Their vision was to take a holistic approach to education, addressing not only academics, but also social, physical, and spiritual development, preparing each student for a lifetime of success and service. Journey to Excellence is a program to help fulfill the vision for vibrant Adventist education in the 21st century. It's a recognition that great schools are not produced by accident, but by a culture that encourages continual, planned innovation and improvement. It's a documented fact that students attending Adventist schools are uniquely successful. They are academically prepared and college-bound. They're clear thinkers who are motivated to achieve. Adventist education is committed to quality. Quality teachers, quality curriculum. In a dangerous world, parents and students alike value the safe atmosphere of an Adventist Christian school. From the well-maintained and secure physical environment to the attitude of openness and acceptance that is found in every classroom, parents of all faith traditions have discovered a haven for their children to safely learn and grow. Empathy Adventist education is open to people of all faiths because its focus is really primarily on Christian values and not simply on the unique convictions of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Shall we all bow our heads and pray? Heavenly Father, glory and honor be unto your holy name, because we have heard the testimonies from our friends about your goodness in their lives and they entrust themselves unto you through Adventist education. Help us, O Lord, and also the parents who are watching with us to send their children to your school so that they will learn more about you. We ask all these things in the mighty and loving name of Jesus. Amen.